boy and for it to stop raining. One time for God to intervene and for him to heal our family and for him to restore it. And he did. When was it that you learned to pray? How young were you? No matter how young or how old we are, we ought to pray. We must realize that there is power in us praying. That there's power in us praying corporately or in our prayer closet. That there is great power in that. But first to pray, we must believe that God is. Or that there is a God. And that He is in heaven. And I would think that if you would ask most people, that many would people would say this, I pray. And that others would also say that they have even seen some answers to prayer. And it's true, because I looked up some surveys and I see that most people claim that they pray. And some of them actually claim that they have seen answered prayers. So in light of that, those statistics, you should think that we would want to pray more and that we should pray more and more. When you think of prayer, if you're taking notes today, I think that no matter where we're at, whether we pray a lot during the week or a little bit during the week, that we can always put this tag on the word prayer and that would be of more that we can always pray more. When Jesus' disciples came to him and they asked him to teach them to pray, he taught them what we're going to look at this morning in Matthew chapter 6. And there are other references to prayer in Scripture, to the beauty of prayer. Do you realize that prayer is equated to the burning of or to the offering up of incense to God? how beautiful incense smell and that they are, they are. That's the way our prayers, his children's prayers are to him. It says that in the book of Revelation. So when they came to him, he taught them, this is how you should pray. In his school of prayer, he, he said, pray this way. And taking for granted that they would do just that, his disciples would pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, the word of God says this. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we also forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now first we look at the text and we realize when he says to pray this way, that he uses the word our Father. So when it comes to prayer, we should add the word more to it. But when we see the phrase, our Father, I think we should also write down and add this phrase to it, that it's about relationship. That because we're believers in Jesus Christ now, God is our Father, and it's about a growing relationship and fellowship with Him. Relationship. Put that in your notes, and if you just grow in that this week, you've grown a lot. We're believers in Christ and we should want to pray more and more and realize that it's a very important way of life and want to be able to say that everything good in our life can and should be traced back to us praying. I like to think that's so in my life, the good things in my life. I want to trace them back. I should be able to trace them back to asking of God, to making my requests known to Him and Him answering. I want the things from His hand. We should pray for things that are good. It's about getting to know God for the Christian. It's about spending time with Him. It's to pray and to listen to God. It's a conversation. Pray and listen. Be quiet before Him. We should want Him then to guide and direct our lives. What is He saying? Get up and do it after you pray. There are many times where I I realize that I've no matter whether it was for minutes or for a half hour or however long it was that I actually reached the hem of his garment, that he heard me and I was able to get back up again. Here's what he says in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. It's about having a conversation with God and listening to him and we can realize so much in prayer, in our prayer time. Why? Because Prayer changes us. It transforms us. It shows us who we are in Christ. And it also 
you've seen the plaques around. Prayer changes things. Prayer, I believe, even changes history. I've watched many battlefield uh, films and this great army is going after a city to plunder them and, and to, to trounce all over them and the tanks are in the field and the soldiers are in the field and they're going after this city and unseasonally it begins to rain, a torrential downpour. And the, tra the, the, tra uh, the, the tanks are uh, mired down in the mud and so are the soldiers. And you, you, you think, you can't help but think, did somebody somewhere pray for God to protect that city? I believe so. We should want to be led by God and God's directing in our lives. It's about relationship. What is eternal life? Jesus said this is eternal life in John 17, 3. And this is eternal life that you, that you may, but that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's about relationship. It's about doing spiritual disciplines to know of God even more. There's so much. His ways are unfathomable almost. But we can get to know Him even more. And our prayer should always have this tag on it, no matter again where we're at, more and more. And it's about wanting a good relationship with God. And when we're in fellowship with God, it's easier for us to show grace to others. I was in a prayer meeting this week meeting with a pastoral association here in Princeton. And I uh, went in there and we prayed together. The leader wasn't there, so we kept praying. And I asked the Lord, the last thing I asked the Lord was, Lord, I need more of your grace this week. And then something happened, and he protected me. And I thought back to the last thing I prayed. That his, I need more of his grace. I'm sure we, if we were to start out one time, we prayed from 6 o'clock in the evening, to the sun come up the next day to dedicate the sanctuary. And I'm, I, I'm sure that if I would start out, I could list many things and go sit down and think of even more, and then you could come up, and we would go on for hours of answered prayer in your life and in my life. It says to pray to our Father who is in heaven. Heaven is considered the place where God dwells. Heaven is the place where his abode is, and we must believe and have faith that he hears us from there. And then Jesus says, hallowed be thy name, to pray this way, to pray these things. What does that mean? To pray in reverence to God. Pray in reverence towards him. Hallowed be your name. Adoring God. Prayer is a way we can worship God. Take the time to do that. Not just our laundry list, but Father, hallowed be your name. May your name be magnified in the earth. And in praying, it is a place for us to show that adoration to God. And it's also a place to make our requests known to God and believe that He hears us and that God can answer us. Paul the Apostle wrote to Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, he said this, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with all attitude of thanksgiving. It's to take prayer seriously. It's to pray, verse 10, as it says, God's kingdom come and God's will be done. I don't know how many times it's maturing in your Christian walk and I suddenly get to this place where I realize I need to pray, Father, your will be done. Give it over to him, the situation over to him. Lord, your will be done, not my will be done. And may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we should be praying and handing over a troublesome situation to God. We should be praying as the church corporately for the things that God wants done and for His purposes to still happen in this world. Even in the midst of all the darkness, God can show up. We should want to pray these things together in the church. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes us. It's about us surrendering to God's will and want him what, what, he, what he wants. And I want to say this to the mature disciples of Jesus Christ, the followers of Jesus Christ this morning. I believe God wants us to teach new disciples or new Christians, new believers to pray. I was praying a few things and went out when they had this uh, thing on um, this show or whatever it was on, on Main Street and uh, was handing out Bibles and 
bulletins from the church, and the Lord was directing me who to speak to. And I walked up, and I saw this young man, and his name is Johnny and uh, John. And I'm going to have lunch with him this week. And, we're, and I'm going to invite him to church, him and his mother. And then I also prayed for God as I went to the Abigail Center for him to increase my borders. So I went over there, and they showed me the ultrasound machine, and she walked me through the whole place. And she wants us to be more involved, and she wants me to help out a little bit more. So I'm going to do that because they're scripturally based. But you pray and you watch God show up and God answer your prayers. And I, I, I'm praying that that young man who has uh, things going on in his life, he needs the Lord. We're going to invite him here next week. I'm going to meet with him on Thursday. Pray that he comes to know Christ as his Savior. Church, we, cannot afford, we, we can't afford not to pray. We ought to be praying. When Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray lest they fall into into temptation, they failed to do it several times. It says that the spirit, though the spirit was willing, the flesh was weak. Why were they so tired? Why did they fall asleep? You have to think, why? Jesus is in the garden. They're going to take him in a little while. They're going to arrest him, seize him, and take him to be crucified. And he's telling his disciples to pray, and they fall asleep. And I wonder why. Was it that they weren't walking in the Spirit? Was it that they were tired because of that? Was it that they were trying to do things in their own strength and and not praying? That's why they were tired? That's why they weren't praying? It's to pray for what is good. And it's also to pray against the things that are wrong in this world because God can put a stop to them. Prayer changes history. The Word of God says because because of someone's faith in Jesus Christ that we can now come boldly to God's throne of grace and, and get our answers. Do you realize in the Old Testament that in the tabernacle there was a holy place and then further beyond that was the holy of holies and that only the high priest could go into the holy of holies once a year. And it's, it, the Bible tells us when the, our Lord was crucified and when he gave up the ghost that right at that moment that the curtain in the Holy of Holies was rent from the top to the bottom. So now, because we are God's children, now because we have our faith in Jesus Christ, we can boldly go to the King of Kings and ask Him and to make our request known to Him. Do you realize the power that's available to you? Do you realize that He's available to you? that he can be a present help in time of trouble for you in any situation. It's to pray and have faith that God is almighty. What does that mean? That he is omnipotent. That he has all the power. That he has supreme power. That his power is unmatched. That he is, God is the dominant controlling factor over absolutely everything. No matter how bad things might look. No matter what the doctor says no matter what the diagnosis is. God is the absolute ruler over everything. And to encourage the church to pray more, I have a letter written home from a Union soldier during the Civil War. And in this, I want you to listen to it, and you could hear some similarities to someone's prayer life or to the lack thereof. December 4th, 1864 from Private John Miller of the Volunteer 123rd Indiana Infantry. He wrote this home. I haven't written to you since I was in Chattanooga, but we have been run about so much so that I scarcely had the time. And we had a pretty hard hard time for a few days. And that when we were at Columbia about 8 to 10 days, then the rebels and the enemy had advanced in that place. And we were caused to lie in the trenches. But he went on to say, I'd rather fight them here than any place else. So note this, too busy for that soldier to correspond. Notice, even during a battle, that he didn't correspond. Notice also that there is an enemy and sometimes in our lives, in ministry and in battles, personal things going on, 
we're too the, we're too busy to pray. We don't we don't pray when, when when there's battles raging in our home with our family. We become too busy being run about here and there. Too often that happens. We should pray again for good things and for God to overcome the bad in this world because he can. Look at verse 11. He said, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, one thing, another pastoral association asked me to pray with them, and I'm not putting anybody down, and I said, listen, if we're going to get together, I'm not going to sit in the back of a restaurant restaurant and chit-chat. I want to pray together. I want to set an example for the church family and for us, and I want to pray for our community. And I have a guide, by the way, that we can go to together, and we can cry out to God for this community. Let's see if they take me up on it. I hope they do. So what does it say? Give us this day our daily bread. What does that mean? For us actually to pray for God's provision of our needs, to ask him from his good hand to give us those things. There's been a few times where I didn't have lunch planned. I didn't bring a lunch. I didn't know how I was going to eat lunch. I didn't even know. You don't take time to figure it out. And I asked the Lord, will you provide for me somehow? Give, give us this day our daily bread. And not to test him. But somebody fed me. Somebody picked up the check. I didn't even ask him. We don't want to test the Lord. I like what somebody said in, in, in a prayer journal I just bought from Gateway. I encourage you. You know, you could write it down on a piece of paper what your prayer requests are and then go back and say, wow, look, he answered that. But in that prayer guide, it cost $10. It said, name five things that you appreciate about God. And then it said, what are some things, some little things, very little things, that you wouldn't even think about asking God for and ask him for those things? And I think God is more glorified in those things when those things happen as much as the big things that he can do. I asked the Lord, my van doors don't open anymore. I don't know why. So I asked him, Lord, show me how to fix it for free. And he did. I ran across somebody. Somebody said, you do this, you do that. But they didn't help me with the power steering that was going out. But I had to get another car. But I'm trying to say, take the littlest things to God. You know, this the Lord's Prayer covers so much. Praying for our daily bread, for the provision of things for us from God our Father, who supplies our needs. Again, every real good thing in my life, I can and should be able to be traced back to praying. There is an old gospel song that's, that says this. I just want to say thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me. And they would sing it. They'll have one singer up there, and they'll sing it for ten minutes. And then he'll get so tired, or she'll get so tired, he'll call in the audience, and they'll, they'll continue to say, Lord, I just want to thank you for all the things you've done for me. On and on. Prayer is a place to show our thankfulness to God. Prayer is also a place and a time where there should be our confession of our sins to God, not to a priest, but to God. Lord, we ag I agree with you. What I did in that situation was wrong, and I and and I agree with you. And now, First John, uh, chapter one, verse nine says this: If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And prayer should also be a time and a place that we should practice our forgiveness of other people. Get down on your knees if, if, if you've been offended and, 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 and ask God to help you to forgive that person. You're wounded. Luke chapter four, eleven, verse 4 says this, that those who have sinned against us, you know what to forgive someone means? It means to send away their debt to you. They no longer owe you any debt. That's what it means to forgive someone. That's, that's what God does with our sins when he forgives us. He separates us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. He drops them in the sea and never brings them up again. The debt is taken care of. It's to send someone's debt to you away. Look at verse 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What is this part of the prayer saying? It's to ask God for the deliverance and help and strength over a temptation 
or from a lust or sinful passion that's beginning to grow in your heart. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said that's where sinful passions start, are in your heart. And when they, they're given birth, they bring forth death. So, Lord, deliver us from temptation. When they begin in our hearts, don't let it take root in my heart. Now, a disciple is a learner of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ intercedes for us. He goes to God on our behalf. And in learning of Him, then, we should go or intercede for other people on their behalf. Who do you know that's in the enemy's clutches right now? Who do you know that you should be praying for? Brian Sater warned this, us knowing that there is the work of the devil, that's his ministry, or of the accuser of the brethren against the church. So it's to pray for God's protection of the evil one. And where the Lord's Prayer can be like a blueprint, transparency of what to pray and how to pray. There are other ones in the Bible that are just as beautiful. And I'm going to close and read one of them. David, God told David, you're not going to build the temple because you have blood on your hands. Meaning he fought the Philistines and he fought wars. He is not going to build the temple because of that. But his son would. That didn't stop David, in a sense. He took, a, uh, he, he took um, a collection from everything that he had, and he gave so much to the Lord, and he prays and he dedicates the temple, and he's encouraged other people for the work of God to give. And then he prays this, this beautiful prayer in First Chronicles chapter 29. And we can learn so much from that too. He prayed this. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, I love this, the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on the earth, yours is the dominion, Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you you and praise your glorious name and as we go forward as a church i've been saying to people we need some victories where is the victories with god and as we meet in the upcoming days i hope you can come up with ideas to do outreach because we want god in it lord willing we want to start ministry what and maybe it's a Sunday evening service, and or maybe it's another uh, young adults ministry, or maybe I just brought it today. God blessed me with it from the closet. Uh, Financial Peace University, basically free. I didn't pay anything for it. So we train one another in righteousness. We teach them practical things in life, how to budget. But in the process, we love on them, and we worship together with them. Let me pray now. Father, I, I pray you would help your people to realize that w- there's so much power in prayer and that we can come boldly into your throne of grace and mercy, that you're our king and we can make our request known to you and that you, you can and will answer us. God, I pray with every fervent ounce of energy in my body for you to add to the number of this church for you to grow the number of it, for you to bring more members here by your Spirit. And I pray for those who are serving you to give us strength and for us to realize that you have the victory, that it's with you and that we need to seek your face before we do anything. May you get the glory now. Use this in our lives. Help us to, if if we're praying, to pray more. And in our relationship with you, help us to grow and that fellowship to become greater. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close in singing this. Number 59.
Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, open to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, Drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, Fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, Earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around the center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, Call us to rejoice in Thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever bless. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the happy chorus, which the morning stars began. Love divine is reigning o'er us, joining all within its span. Ever singing, marching onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in thy trump of song.